second Innovate Bio CRISPR series webinar. Today we have our second presentation from BioRad on using the CRISPR-Cas9 with out of the blue CRISPR gene editing and genotyping kits. Um, so we're very excited to have them back with us today. Um, I also wanna remind everyone who's on that this series continues next week for our third installment of the CRISPR series when we have Delaware Technical Community College presenting on an innovative laboratory exercise with Chris curriculum and CRISPR gene editing. And um, they will be, it'll be John McDowell, who's the PI of an ATE project that they have along with um, some of his team. So we're excited for that as well. Same time, same place, next Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern. I wanted to remind everyone to please stay muted during the presentation and um, we do anticipate, again, having time at the end for you to unmute and ask questions. During the presentation, please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions or leave comments. With that, I'll hand it over to Lee to get us started. Hello, hello. Um, thank you, guys. Um, my name is Lee Brown, for those of you who don't know me. And I work for BioRad as a curriculum and training specialist. Um, I'm in Texas, right between, <clears throat> excuse me, between Austin and San Antonio. Um, oh, apologies. We have terrible cedar fever here. For those of you in Texas, you'll know uh, what I'm dealing with now. But um, so I've been working for BioRad for about 10 years. We also have Damon Ty on with us as well. He may pop in every once in a while. And um, he is my counterpart on the West Coast. So if you're California, Arizona, Colorado, you know, on over there, then that's who your main source of con or main point of contact at BioRad probably is. And we have Tamika Stubb. She's not on this call, but um, if you're in the um, East Coast or Northeast, that's your contact person there. And then we also have Erin Callis. And I forgot I had a slide of all of us, so there we go. Um, you're welcome to email any of us at that email address right there, explorer at bio-rad.com. And it will go to um, our admin Everybody, list. Welcome back. Mr. Campbell with another tutorial here. Um, part of me just wants to Sorry. stand up and cheer and clap and scream. Okay, there we go. Um, so that will go to... Um, Leslie, who will get it to the right person. Erin handles a lot of the community colleges all over the country and some of the, the smaller states um, or less populated states, um, Nebraska, Louisiana, Alabama, you know, all over basically. So um, that's it. So if you're, if you have questions after this, please don't hesitate to give us an email. Uh, I'll put my email in the chat and Damon and Delquin are in the chat right now to answer any questions as they come up. Um, we don't have a huge group, so if you want to just unmute yourself, that's fine too, or um, the BioRad people that are in the chat can interrupt and uh, let us know as well, because I'm sure some of you will have questions as we go through it. I'll try to pause every once in a while just to kind of look in the chat and see what kinds of questions you have, um, but don't hesitate because it, I can guarantee you this is a lot to take in, right? Like we already did a webinar about CRISPR last week, and that was kind of talking about the mechanisms of CRISPR, how it works, and um, the applications of it, and we did a little bit of modeling. So if you have that foundation, you'll be in a little bit better shape. I don't assume that everyone was able to watch that webinar. Um, I'll put, or Yolanda, if you don't mind putting the link to our YouTube um, videos in the chat, that would be awesome. Um, the, the webinar that we did last week is, I think, available on Innovate. Is that right, Heather? I don't know if it's available. It is. Here. I'm going to, I'll post the link in the chat. Um, I'm going to post the link to the Innovate Bio site, but also direct to YouTube because depending on what browser you're using, it seems there's a little issue with playback. So, um, you know, just test which one works best for you. We're, we're working through the kinks. Terrific. Terrific. So, so uh, that one is in the, um, on Innovate, there's a shorter version of it on our YouTube channel that Damon's narrating. And then the, the video that I'm doing today, there's a short version of that on YouTube as well that shows you the hands-on piece 
as well. So that's available for you to watch or for your students to watch. It's, you know, um, I didn't get into the answers of the lab in the video on YouTube because we assume that students are going to watch it. Um, so we don't want to necessarily post all that up there. Um, but we'll talk, uh, we'll talk through that today. Okay. So uh, let me go ahead and go through this. So today we're going to look at our out of the blue CRISPR and genotyping oh. extension kits. That's two separate kits and they are um, available now. We launched them in March and then later on in the summer for the genotyping extension. Um, the great news about this is if you're, already doing, if you're already doing, um, doing uh, a transformation lab, this is the same technique. You'll just do another transformation. Um, that's actually the students are doing four transformations in the, the CRISPR lab. And then the genotyping extension is just a PCR lab. So these labs aren't technically any more different, difficult than what you're probably already used to doing, which is really nice. Um, you don't necessarily have to do the genotyping extension. We'll talk about why uh, we like it and why you know it's something that you might want to consider, especially if you already have all the equipment and all that good stuff. Okay. So here is the uh, beginning and end of the CRISPR lab. And what students are going to start with is these blue colonies, and they're going to use CRISPR to uh, gene edit those, the, the, the DNA inside those bacteria so that they are no longer blue when planted on the same media. Now they're white, okay? So let's look at how that happens. So right here, we're looking at, and again, this, this PowerPoint's available. Um, uh, Galanda, I think the, the if you can copy the link that I sent you or let me know if it doesn't work and I can share it um, in, the, in the chat. If not, I'll share it at the end if it doesn't work. Um, we, have a, we have a student facing version of this PowerPoint as well. This one goes into a little bit more depth just because it's teacher facing so we can talk about the answers and things like that as well, okay? But so uh, this should look familiar to you. You have a plate of, um, agar with E. coli on it. It normally forms these kind of creamy white colonies. And, um, you know, it looks just like this. So in E. coli, there is a gene called LACZ. And um, that goes for an enzyme called beta-galactosidase or beta-gal. Um, some of you are probably already doing some blue white screening and this might be familiar to you. I'm just going to go over it for those who aren't doing it and who are just, you know, it's been a long time or whatever. So um, if you're already doing this, this will be a little bit old hat, but just to kind of cover our basics. So E. coli have a gene called LACC that codes for an enzyme called beta-galactosidase or beta-gal. And that enzyme normally breaks down lactose, but it can also break down an artificial substrate called X-gal, okay? And that X-gal is in our media. Uh, when beta-gal breaks down X-gal, there's a blue pigment, pigment that's formed, and that's what turns those colonies blue. So when E. coli are plated on a plate that contains X-gal plus IPDG, which we're kind of glossing over for now, um, they will grow uh, into these blue colonies, okay? So functional, uh, functional like Z gene means that the E. coli will be blue on the type of agar that we're using in all of our plates. Okay. Now, what if we mutate like Z, right? So if we mutate like Z, we don't get beta-galactosidase. There's no, uh, that enzyme is not made. So even if we plate it on plates that contain X-gal and IPGG, um, that beta-galactosidase isn't there to break it down, so we don't get the blue pigment, right? So now these bacteria, without the functional like C, they're going to grow into white colonies, okay? okay. So hopefully that part makes sense. Let me know if, you're, if you need more explanation or are getting stuck or anything, okay? So um, let me go back here. All right. So in this lab, the whole goal is for students to use CRISPR to edit the lag Z gene. So on the left, we have our functional lag Z gene. Our colonies are blue because they're grown on plates that contain XGAL and IP2G. And once students use CRISPR to edit that gene, 
and kind of make it non-functional. Now our, um, we're not making it beta-galactosidase. So even though the, the media is the same, the colonies will turn white. Okay, so this is the phenotype that we're gonna look at in this lab, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so in the last workshop last week, we talked a little bit about this and I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail here so we can uh, really get into the nitty gritty of how this particular lab works. Um, but when we're doing CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, there's a cut and a repair that happens, okay, in this lab. Um, if you'll remember, we have a Cas9 single guide RNA complex that targets and cuts the DNA. And then the repair process can happen by one of two modes. Um, you can either have non-homologous end joining, which is prone to kind of insertions and deletions, a little bit more error prone. Um, the, the repair process that we're using in this lab is homology directed repair. Okay, so I'm gonna get into that here next. So, okay, here we have our Cas9 protein. <laughs> And this is a nuclease, so it will cut DNA, but it has to be told where to cut DNA. Um, so it, sorry, let me get my cursor here. There we go. That single guide RNA is something that scientists create in the lab. It's got a scaffolding region. Okay, so you see that hairpin loop um, that binds to the Cas9 protein. And it also has a 20 nucleotide region that tells Cas9 where to cut the DNA, okay? So that's how this complex can find the target DNA and then Cas9 can cut it, okay? So what'll happen is it'll scan the DNA. Um, I'm kind of glossing over bits and pieces of this. It's a little bit more detailed and we have a whole DNA model that goes into this um, where it uses these PAM sequences to kind of stop and check the DNA. Um, but, you know, kind of high level here again. So it's gonna scan the, the target DNA, our, our gene in this case, and uh, once it finds a region of that DNA that's complementary to that um, target uh, sequence, the 20 nucleotide guiding sequence in the single guide RNA, it'll stop and um, Look all your squirrels. Okay. Um, so Cas9 can make that cut. So we just have a double stranded break. Now, if bacteria get a double strand break in their DNA, they are no longer very happy, right? So this causes all kinds of problems. Um, this is chromosomal DNA, remember it's not a plasmid um, in, in our lab. And so we are looking at you know, a lethal phenotype if we have a cut in the DNA that's not repaired, okay? So keep that in mind, that becomes important later on. Okay, so bacteria have evolved ways to repair their genes, uh, repair their chromosomes if they have these double-stranded breaks because otherwise they're done, right? Um, so again, that's when we get the, the non-homologous in-joining, NHEJ, or the homology-directed repair. This lab uses homology-directed repair. So let me show you what that looks like. So on the left, we have the cutting piece that uh, I just explained with Cas9 and the single guide RNA. Now on the right, this is where we're talking about the repair. So we have that cut DNA, right? We have that cut DNA, it's just got a double stranded break in the middle of it. And we also have in this lab some donor DNA. And um, this is a simplified drawing. We go into more detail in the, the manual, but just kind of, again, keeping it somewhat high level for this, um, this workshop today. Um, there is a region in that donor DNA that's what we want to repair it with, right? And so depending on what researchers are doing, they can design this, this donor to be whatever they want. They can swap out a nucleotide, they can add nucleotides, um, they can make a gene non-functional, right? insert a stop code on. So there's lots of different options here. Um, but that donor DNA has on the outside these homology arms. Um, and they are homologous to the cut piece of DNA, right? So that's why you see the blue ends on that donor are going to be um, complementary to the, the um, ends of the cut DNA from our target DNA, okay? And then we can use the bacterial repair machinery proteins to actually kind of stitch that in, okay? So now we have our cut piece of DNA with our donor insert DNA right in the middle, okay? Does that make sense? I'm gonna stop here and check in the chat and make sure everything's okay. Cause this is, this is one of those things where, um, it, this is a lot of biology for your students to sink in, you know, to kind of process and think about here. It's, uh, the, the lab itself is super easy. It's no more difficult than PLO. It's all this biology that's really kind of like, whoa. So let me just check the chat, make sure there's no, 
panic attacks in there. Um, any, let's see. I think a lot of our issues are coming up with the links not opening again. Um, we had this, just to everyone, we had this issue um, within Zoom and I'm trying to troubleshoot it. I don't think it's us, I think it's Zoom. So we'll try to find a better way to provide them. Let me, let me copy a new link in here. Give me one second. Um, it's also our sharing thing within Biorad. Sharing to external links is sometimes a little dicey. So let me see if this one works. Uh, oh, sorry, give me one second. Okay. Um, okay. Try, does that, oh, oh, hold on, I accidentally, try this and see if that works, please. Nope, that's not gonna work, hold on. I, I can troubleshoot it, we can provide it um, at the end. Maybe would that work? Anyone with link, this is the problem. Allow editing, set password, apply, copy link, okay. I think that one should work. I think it was just set for only people within BioRab. Sorry about that, guys. And this this link that I have actually has the PowerPoint from the previous week too. So we're kind of farther down in there. We're like down at the bottom. Okay. Like 38-ish, 30, 30-ish. Okay. All right. Now, so let's go back over here. Okay. Okay, so in this particular lab, we are, like I said, editing the LAG-Z gene. So we are, um, our target DNA in this case is a region inside that gene in LAG-Z. So LAG-Z is going to be targeted, a, a region of that, 20 nucleotide region of that. Um, our guide RNA will bind to, Cas9 will cut it, make a double-stranded break. And then we are going to insert a piece of donor DNA that has a stop codon. So that stop codon will be added inside the LAG-Z gene and um, that will make it non-functional, right? So hopefully that makes sense. So again, we have these four pieces here. We have Cas9, we have the guide RNA, we have the donor DNA, and we have the bacterial repair machinery, okay? And those are just enzymes um, inside E. coli um, that are going to be responsible for inserting that donor DNA within, uh, within that cut lag C gene. Okay, so those are all the four components. Let's talk a little bit about the controls. This is why this lab is, is really nice, is we, it's, it's very well controlled so that they can see that they're actually um, doing CRISPR, right? Because, you know, otherwise it's just kind of boring. I mean, um, you could you could knock out Lexi in a number of ways, but we want to kind of show the students that they've actually used CRISPR to edit that gene and make it non-functional. Okay, so we've got some controls for them to understand that. And again, these next two slides are just kind of a big picture thing. Remember, we're going from blue colonies on the starter plates that have a functional Lexi, and then the students are going to edit them using CRISPR so that we knock out that Lexi um, by adding a stop code onto it and making it non-functional. So now the bacteria are white when they grow on the same sort of media, okay? We need those four components, Cas9, the guide RNA, donor DNA, and the repair machinery. Could you repeat what you said? Did you say in that donor DNA there is a stop codon? Yes, that's right. And that was just engineered by um, I'm Delquin. I'm assuming, I'm assuming you and George came up with that. <laughs> she, can, she can answer in the chat. So scientists can engineer those donor pieces of DNA um, to have all kinds of things, right? You might need to fix a nucleotide, um, like in the case of cystic fibrosis or something like that, right? You might want to just change one nucleotide. Um, but we made this one, we wanted to just make the LAG-Z gene non-functional. So there's a stop code on in there. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Yes, thank you. I just didn't hear it at the beginning. No worries. So let's take a look at where all those four components are in this lab. Okay, so to, just to kind of get an idea again of how does this all come together? You know, seeing it on a PowerPoint is one thing. What does it mean when you're actually working with the, you know, the bacteria in the lab? So Cas9 is expressed in these E. coli all the time, just always on. 
Okay, so that's where our enzyme, our nuclease is going to come from. So that's one we've taken care of. Um, the repair machinery proteins. Remember, these are the proteins needed to stitch that DNA, the donor DNA into the cut DNA. Those are under control of an arabinose promoter. Okay, um, if you've done PGLO or any kind of transcriptional control lab with your students, this might you know look familiar to you. Um, it's a little bit different. I'm going to show you that right now. So the starter plates that we have in this lab, there's two different types of starter plates. You are going to plate bacteria. Again, the bacteria have a functional Leipzig gene. They're going to get plated on um, plates that contain IPTG and XGAL and with or without arabinose. Okay, so, half the, so some of the plates have arabinose, some of them don't. If the plates do have arabinose, those starter bacteria will have their repair machinery proteins turned on. Okay, so arabinose is just um, uh, going to bind to that promoter and those genes will be transcribed and translated. Okay, without arabinose, on, in the plates without arabinose, that repair machinery protein, the repair machinery proteins are turned off. Okay, the, those aren't, um, uh, the expression's turned off. They're not transcribed or translated. So this is a control for the repair machinery proteins. You know, if you, if you go through and you edit everything and you have all the goodies that you need, but you, the bacteria don't have the ability to put that donor DNA into the cut target DNA, what happens? Okay, so this gives them an ability to think about that. And we'll, we'll go over this in a minute here too. Okay. We also have two different types of plasmids. So there is a PLZ donor um, guide and a PLZ donor, okay? And uh, students are going to use both of these, each of these plasmids um, in two different plates each. So let's go through what that looks like, what's in each of them. Both of the plasmids have the donor DNA in them, okay? They both have the donor DNA. Only one of the plasmids, the PLZ donor guide, has the single guide RNA. Remember the guide RNA is what tells Cas9 where to cut. So that has the information that 20 nucleotide guiding region that um, binds to the target DNA and shows Cas9, hey, cut here, okay? So PLC donor guide or PDG for plasmid donor guide, um, that one has the donor DNA and the single guide RNA. PD, which stands for plasmid donor, only has the donor DNA. It does not have the single guide RNA. Okay, so I, you know, again, if I were teaching students, I would let them kind of think about this for a while to talk in groups. What would, my, what would that mean? What would, what would kind of fall apart in the process if we used um, PD versus PDG, right? If we don't have that single guide RNA, can Cas9 cut or not? What will we expect that phenotype to look like? Okay. So you're welcome to, again, you know, type stuff in the chat or kind of get some, uh, thought processes going. When I'm doing this with students, we actually do a lot of breakout rooms and I just put them in groups of three or four and um, they kind of make a lot of predictions at this point uh, and with the, the repair machinery proteins on or off as well. Um, I'm gonna show you how I do that in PowerPoint next, okay? So, okay, so I like to start off with the experimental plate, the one that has all the components that we need so we can see what happens, okay? So, and, and students will do one plate of um, the experimental plate, right? The one that has all of the, all the goodies. Okay, so remember the bacteria, the starter plates um, with the blue bacteria, those bacteria have Cas9 in them. And if we use the starter plates with Arabinose, the they also have the repair machinery proteins being made. Okay, so we're going to use the starter plates that have arabinose. That bacteria, that E. coli, has Cas9 in it, and it also has the repair machinery proteins turned on. Now, if we add the PDG plasmid in a transformation, this is just a simple transformation, very similar to PGLO. I'll go over the um, differences here in a bit. Um, if we add PDG plasmid, we're adding the single guide RNA. Okay, so that single guide RNA can now tell Cas9 where to cut, right? So the single guide RNA has that region that's complementary to the region in lag Z that we're trying to edit. Cas9 can bind and make that cut. Great, so now we've cut our DNA. Good. Um, now, we also wanna repair it, right? Because remember, cut DNA without a repair is dead bacteria, okay? So, 
can we repair it? Well, we need, remember the donor DNA, and we also need those repair machinery proteins. The donor DNA is on both plasmids, so it is there. The PDG plasmid has the donor DNA. That's that little um, blue and red DNA with the stop sign in the middle. So we're good there, we have the donor DNA. Um, the homology arms are gonna line up with our cut target DNA. And again, since we use the starter bacteria that have arabinose in the plates, those repair machinery proteins are turned on. And so those will be used to um, add that donor DNA into our cut D, uh, target DNA, into our cut like Z gene. And so that enables us to put that stop code on in the like Z gene, effectively turning it off. I'm gonna stop there for a second and let it process and look at the chat and see how, how you guys are doing. <laughs> okay, I see George is giving Jim a little trouble. I love it. <laughs> Lee, I have a quick question. Yes. So do all of the starter bacteria have Cas9 in them? They do. They do. Okay. Yes, they do. Thank you. No problem. All the starter bacteria will look the same to the students. They'll all be blue colonies. Um, you'll have labeled the plates or, or, or you know, if you're having the, in, in a biotech class, you should probably have them prepping the lab. Um, or uh, they'll just be labeled with um, the plates will either have a ravenous or not. Okay. Okay. So here's, you know, the, uh, let me just stop here. What phenotype would you expect to, this to look like? What do you, what would you predict the, the plate would look like in this situation? You can add in the chat or unmute yourself, either one. No colony. No colony. Uh, so let me give you the options here. No color. I said no color. No color. Okay, great. Yes. They'll be white, right? They'll just look like regular E. coli growing on a regular L. biogar plate, okay? Um, so that's exactly what you'll get, okay? So they went from blue colonies to white colonies. Excellent, okay. So now here is kind of the diagram of the four plates that your students are going to do. Um, and they are going to mix different starter plates with different plasmids, right? Um, D is the one that we just looked at, but I want to go through and look at the other ones individually. And so we can kind of go through what each of the plates look like and why um, they'll get, you know, what kind of predictions they can make about um, what phenotype they'd expect to see and why that is. So two of the plates, A and C, get the PD plasmid. Remember, that's the one that has the donor DNA, but not the single guide RNA, okay? So the single guide RNA is not present. That means that Cas9 won't know where to cut. Two of the plates will get the PDG plasmid. That means they get the donor DNA as well as the single guide RNA. So now we can target um, our LAC Z gene and we have the donor DNA to, to repair it. Um, two of the plates will get the colonies that were grown on plates containing arabinose. Um, I'm sorry, without arabinose. So the repair machinery proteins are turned off. They're not expressed. And two of the plates will get the colonies, the bacteria um, from the plates that do contain arabinose. So that repair machinery is turned on. Okay, that's a lot to take in, right? So I'm gonna go through individually and look at what's on and off in each one um, so that you know it can, it can sink in a little bit more. Okay, so this is the slide that I usually just copy and put in PowerPoint for students. And we let them go through and get in groups and they kind of make decisions on what do they think is happening in each of these, right? Um, do they think that there was a cut made? Do they think that there was a repair made and why? And so I usually give them about 10 minutes. It, it, this is a lot to think through. Um, and we're gonna go through this in a minute, but I just let them, you know, I, they can delete um, the the cut or repair, right? And just if it if it's cut, then they can leave the green check mark. If it's uh, not cut, they can leave the red red X, right? Um, and they can make predictions based on that. And then once they've got that filled out, I let them go through and predict what the phenotypes will look like. Okay, so let's take these one at a time. This is the manual version of that. Um, this is the one in the manual. It's um, the exact same thing that I just showed you, just not as, you know, it's it's more straightforward, but it's not, there's no pictures. So they can think through this in the manual as well, okay? Um, here's the phenotypes. So again, you can have no bacteria, you can have white or colorless bacteria or blue bacteria. 
Um, I seem to be missing, hold on for one second. Am I missing my slides that have all the things broken out? Ah, here we go. So I'm gonna let you guys look at this and we can talk about what, what y'all, what, what kind of predictions you can make. So let's look at A. Um, in A, we have, remember, the plasmid that has the donor DNA, it does not have single guide RNA, um, and it does not have the repair machinery. So in the chat, just make a prediction here. Do you think that we're going to get cutting or not? Will there be, will the, will lag C be cut or not? So just go ahead and type there. All right, so most of you are saying no, great. Okay, so no cut. Um, we can look at the repair, but if there's no cut, there's nothing to repair, right? So um, that's kind of like a, a moot question at this point, or a moot question if you're friends of, uh, fans of cheer, uh, friends. Um, so there's no cut, there's also no repair because there's nothing to repair. Uh, now, make a prediction of what you think this colony would look like. These colonies would look like when you played them. What would you expect to see? Would they be no colonies, white colonies, blue colonies? Blue colonies, yeah, exactly, right? So these will look almost identical to their starter plates. They should really look the same. I mean, they're not going to be, the colonies aren't going to be as old, obviously, um, but that's exactly right. Okay, so now let's look at B. So with B, we're adding, uh, we're using that same bacteria. We're using the bacteria that were grown on the plates without arabinose, so no repair machinery. Now, however, we're adding a different plasmid. So when we do that transformation, the plasmid that we're adding is PDG. And remember, that one has the guide RNA and it has the donor DNA. So now we're adding that guide RNA, remember, that has the, the, the guiding region that is um, complementary to our region in LAC-Z that we want to cut. So we've got the guide RNA, we have Cas9s and all of this. Um, we have the donor DNA, but we don't have the repair machinery. So take a second here, look at B. Do we get a cut here? And you can answer the repair part too. Yeah, we do get a cut, right? So the cut, remember, requires just Cas9, which is in all the bacteria. And it requires that single guide RNA to tell us where to cut. Okay, so we're effectively able to target that region in lac Z and make that cut. Okay, now if it cuts, we're gonna need a repair, yes? So in order to have the repair, we need that donor DNA, which we do have. And we also need the repair machinery proteins, which we don't have. So we don't get a repair, as many of you are saying. What would you expect the phenotype of these bacteria to be? Yeah, these are the guys with the little X's over their eyes, right? So these are all dead. Um, you will not, hopefully, not see any colonies um, uh, with this plate. So these will be just, you know, a, a, an empty looking plate, right? So all the bacteria have died. Okay, awesome. Okay, so let's look at C. So with C, now we are shifting to our plate that has arabinose in it and that arabinose gives us the um, repair machinery right so that's kind of what we're adding now that gives us the ability to make a repair so in c we have the plasma that does not have the guide rna it does have the donor dna what would you expect to happen in c with the cut process is can it cut or no Yeah, no cut. And Jim has a good question. Is the cutting absolute? Um, or is there any leakiness in the process? Um, I'm going to let Delquan answer that officially from an R&D standpoint, but I've done this lab probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 times. And when I say I've done it 10 or 12 times, I mean, I've done like a whole class set 10 or 12 times because I'm doing it on Zoom. I haven't seen that, Jim. Delquan, do you, have, do you want to chime in here on the leakiness of, of the cutting process? If it, if it is. Mm -hmm. So is the question here, you know, when we see like all blue, all white versus a sprinkling of blue and white, is that sort of the question here? I think the question is what's the efficiency of the, um, of the cat, you know. Uh, 
Um, so you're saying like, if, if, it, if it's not 100% efficient, then we might expect to see some blue colonies on our B plate, for example, right? Oh, that's right. Yeah, so, I, I, I don't know. Have, have we seen any of that? In, yeah, in you know, um, in all of our testing, um, that for the most part, we get um, no colonies on our B plates. So without any repair going on, and with the cutting happening, we almost, we get mostly over 90% of the time, I hate to quantify it, but there's like no survival of bacteria. You'll on occasion, if you do it enough times, you'll see, you know, one or two or a couple of there, which is kind of interesting because that's the, the um, unusual, the unexpected um, outcome, so. Yeah, that's the question, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I haven't, I haven't so, been lucky enough to see any of that, but. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you, Quinn and Jen, that was a good question. So in C, we again, don't have the cut. We need that single guide RNA to tell us where to cut. Without that, Cas9 is kind of aimless, right? It'll be scanning, but it won't ever find a target. Um, so the, um, there's no cut, therefore there's no repair to, you know, there's nothing to repair. So what would you expect these colonies to look like? I think a lot of you have already added this and see without a cut, they'll be blue. Exactly. Okay. And D is the first one that we did. Remember, that's the one that has all the components that we need. It has um, the, it has Cas9 from the bacteria. It has the uh, single guide RNA from the plasmid. It has the donor DNA from the plasmid and it has those repair machinery proteins turned on. So we will find, you know, Cas9 will cut the Lagzu gene in the target region and that donor DNA will insert a stop code on in that um, Lagzu gene. And then we will get the white colonies, okay? So um, any questions on all four of those plates? This is a lot like this, this for me was a lot to kind of take in and sink in. It took me a while to just kind of think through it, right? And um, there's a lot going on here. Um, everything is not 100% controlled for this. And that's something that you can talk to your students about. You know, that's part of the experimental design that um, Delpin and George worked on this for years, really, on deciding what would be, uh, we wanted to give them a way to show kind of what pieces and parts were necessary and show them that they were indeed doing CRISPR. Um, but if we controlled for absolutely everything, it would be a little bit unwieldy. Um, so anyway, that's something to maybe talk to, through with your students as well. Okay, uh, so again, I like to give them these three phenotypes and let them paste onto that previous slide that I showed you. And they can, you know, put their predictions in each of those four squares. That, that to me seems to work pretty well. And that way they kind of get a sense of what they should expect to see, okay? So again, dead colonies we would expect in B, white colonies in D, and blue colonies in A and C. Okay, these are still functional like Z since nothing was cut. Okay, so um, I'm actually gonna, let me skip, hold on. I wanna go down to the, um, Give me one second. I just want to show you guys the protocol real quickly because I mentioned that it was a bit different from PGLO and I know most of you have done PGLO. So let me just switch my screen over for just a second. Um, this one, share. And hopefully y'all can see So let me show you the protocol. Maybe. Here we go. Okay. So this gets a little bit into the teacher prep and it also goes into the student protocol. So let me just go over this real quickly. So if you're familiar with doing a bacterial transformation, especially PGLO, I can compare it to that. Um, you're going to pour plates. The plates that you'll pour are starter plates with IPTG, XGAL, and uh, with or without arabinose. okay? 
um, and you'll also re prepare another set of starter plates that the students will use after they've done the transformation, and those will have um, XGAL, IPGG, and spectinomycin. Okay, spectinomycin is going to be a selection um, antibiotic for the transformants. So any questions on that? And we have microwave directions available for this now, yay! So um, I have found it works good with a hot plate. Um, if you have an autoclave, of course, it's always better. Your plates will last longer. Um, but I've had good luck. Just I, I, prep, I prep everything in my kitchen because I work from home, especially this year. Um, and so I found that prepping my plates in the microwave works well, and the plates will keep two to three weeks. That's pretty standard with any kind of you know plate pouring that you're doing at home, anyway. Okay, um, you'll do the starter colonies. And again, we recommend that these are really grown at 37 degrees. This is really important. Um, I know that sometimes you can do them at room temperature. Um, I, don't point out if you want to speak to this. It, isn't it more crucial in this lab in particular to grow these starters at 37? Is that accurate? I would say so. You, you kind of, because these are the starter plates, you really want to make sure that they're healthy and they're growing well and they get their good time at 37 degrees and plenty of um, um, just recovery time before they get streaked out. And that's really going to help you boost your results at the end. So one of the things I'll, I'll add that is just a little trick, and we've got the directions um, spelled out pretty well at this point now, but one of the things that's really crucial is that the, the Kix mix comes, Kix is um, uh, canamycin, IPTG, and XCAL. Um, canamycin is in all the plates, so we kind of just ig ignore that. Sorry, I should have said that earlier, but canamycin is in all these plates. So that mix needs to be mixed really well when you're putting it into the auger, because if you don't, you're not going to get blue colonies, right? And that's really important. Um, so just make sure that you're swirling it around. It doesn't dissolve very well, but it will once you heat it up. We microwave it or, or put it in a um, on the heat block, uh, not the heat block, the, why am I having a... I'm having a Friday afternoon brain fart. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Um, when you're heating the auger, that Kix mix goes in there, it will dissolve in there. Um, but it's just real important to make sure that you get enough of it into the, the different augers. The E. coli, um, when you're doing the starter plates, um, I keep these, the, the, is it, I think it's the IPTG that's light sensitive or is it the XGAL? Now I've forgotten. One of the ingredients in the auger is light sensitive. And so you wanna keep those in the dark. When I'm incubating all of these, I just put a piece, I have that little mini incubator from and it's only this big. I just put a piece of uh, cardstock in front of it and it closes that whole window and keeps everything nice and dark. And then when I'm storing my plates, the other plates, the ones with spectinomycin that the students are going to be streaking their bacteria on after the transformation, I wrap those in aluminum foil and throw them in the fridge. Okay, so that's another difference between PGLO and this lab. Lee, I have a question. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, so you're saying you can actually microwave the canamycin X gal and IPTG? I know, isn't that weird? Yeah, I, I was kind of shocked, but yes, we do microwave it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, the canamycin's in there. The spectinomycin you add later, just like you do with um, uh, the P Glow Lab, right? So, like a rabbinous. That's something we go wrong. Okay, so. Um, Oops. Hold on. Why am I not clicking there? Oh, it's it's really slow. Hold on. I got ahead of myself now. Give me a second. Okay, here we go. Oh my goodness, it's so slow. Sorry, guys. Okay, so here's the stamp portion of the lab. They're going to label four tubes A through D. And now I, this is a, a, another reason I wanted to show you guys the protocol. I know everyone is in this weird, super weird stage of like doing hybrid or trying to socially distance in the labs or, you know, you don't even know what next week is going to look like. Um, this lab is meant for a group of four. Uh, it's designed for that. You can have them work in as, you know, few of people per group as you want. Um, this one's a really easy one just to give every student their own tube and let them do their own transformation with, okay? Because you've got four different transformations that are happening here. So if you want to socially distance them, um, then just do it that way. Put one person in charge of A, one in charge of B, one in charge of C, one in charge of D. They can do the whole transformation and plate them, and then they're going to interpret their results as a group, right? So that's a really easy way to do this. So they'll label their tubes, they're going to keep them on ice, um, 
this is uh, the transformation procedure. George and Dalpin really worked hard on optimizing this. And one of the things that gives you really good transformation success is keeping that transformation solution, the calcium chloride, on ice um, with the bacteria for a longer bit of time, so 20 minutes or so. So, okay, so the transformation solution, everything just stays on ice as long as you're not working with the tube. They're going to put five colonies into their tubes. So A and B will get colonies from the, the, the plate without arabinose. So the X plate, it's IPDG and XGAL. Okay, no arabinose. So five colonies go into A, five colonies go into B. You're gonna do the washing machine with the loop and swirl it around. Since the colonies are blue, it's really easy to see if they're dispersed in that um, calcium chloride, right? So that makes it really easy. Swirl for a minute. I'm, I'm usually kind of lazy. I just swirl until I don't see any clumps of bacteria anymore. And sometimes that does take a full minute. So um, if your students are pretty used to doing transformations, you might want to just, you know, um, let them go at it. Uh, if they're, if this is new, then you might want to give them like specific directions of doing it for a minute. Um, of course, you'll use a, a, you should use a different loop for both of these and then just put the tubes back on ice. Okay. Lee, quick question. Yes, ma'am. Is it critical that these plates be a certain um, number of hours old, having been streaked? Can they be used in the morning and again in the evening, or should they just be 24 hours exactly, or does it matter? They can be, in my experience, I'll let Delquan speak too. Um, she knows that I am not as, as um, particular as R&D is. <laughs> But um, <laughs> Trish, I will say that we have mailed these out to people and that's why uh, uh, at the end we'll have a hands on sign up if you want to do this hands on with me. We have actually mailed these out, um, the starter plates and I've mailed them on Monday and we've used them on Thursday, right? So it's ideally it's, mm. you know, 24 hours, but it's not, you know, I'm sure it's better at 24 hours. Let me put it that way. Um, if, but if, if it's, it's okay, I can weigh in here a little bit. Yes. Um, I, I think the critical thing here is just, you know, the, um, you know, we don't say anything about colony size, you know, pick five colonies, but you know, really the, the biggest, fattest colonies you can see, you're probably going to get, you know, better results because you're just starting off with more bacteria. Um, the other thing is I, I think dispersing it in the tube is pretty important because once you've got a clump in there, you know, now you've got a whole bunch of bacteria, but if they're not um, freely available in solution, then you're not really getting a good transformation efficiency. And I think the key thing really is just, you want your bacteria happy. So, you know, you wanna make sure they have good growth. Say you put them in the refrigerator, you know, cause you're not ready to do it. And then when you take them out, you know, just kind of revive them a little, make sure they're warm at room temperature, just kind of pop them in the, the incubator a little bit to warm them up and get them happy again. I, I think that's just sort of the starting state of where that bacteria are will make a, make a difference. The, um, when, we've, when we've mailed ours, it was in the summer and I never put them in the incubator to begin with. I just grew them at room temperature. Um, so they certainly weren't as happy as the ones that I've done just at 37 degrees, right? But they, they work fine. Um, so I don't know if you've noticed or not, but in that bottom picture where you see the starter plate, it's actually a four phase streak. It's not just three, which is kind of typical. And that's to give your students more plump bacteria colonies to start with. It just gives them, you know, a little bit higher chance that they'll have a starter plate that they can easily pick because they'll need 10 colonies, right? Um, for these two tubes from that one plate, okay? So again, if you're like me and you're used to kind of stretching things, uh, like I'll, for Piglo, sometimes I'll just make a few starter plates for the whole class. It's a little bit more difficult here because they'll need 10 colonies per group um, from each of those plates. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so now um, they'll add the, um, oops, did I miss a thing here? I must have. Oh yeah, I think I went through it. So then they add the bacteria from the plate without arabinose into A and B. They add five colonies from the bacteria that were grown with arabinose to C and D. So now you've got A and B with um, bacteria that have Cas9 and the repair machinery proteins are not expressed. In C and D, you have bacteria with Cas9 and the repair machinery proteins are expressed. Okay, so that's the difference between those two um, or those four tubes. 
Now we're gonna add, and everything is on ice at this point. Now we're gonna add the plasmid. So 10 microliters, we do recommend that they have a micropipette. I think most of you guys are in classrooms where that's not an issue. Um, I do have an alternative protocol for this. If for some reason you don't have a micropipette for your students to, to use, um, you just email me and I'll give you that protocol because that's what we've had to been, that's how we've been doing it over the summer because um, instructors don't often have a full set of micropipettes at home. So we've had to kind of adapt things. But ideally, they can add the, micro, the plasmid to their tubes. So PD, remember, that's the plasmid that's just the donor plasmid. It has the donor DNA without the single guide RNA. That's going to go into tubes A and C. And then PDG will go into tubes B and D. And again, you're going to put those back on ice and just let them incubate for a while, um, getting good and cold there. Okay, um, 10 minutes, this can go longer if it needs to, um, but at least for 10 minutes, okay. Um, I'm going to come back to this, actually, that's just a little bit of math that you can do in the downtime. So that's looking at the specificity between the single guide RNA and, um, say, for example, comparing it to a restriction enzyme. We talked about that last week, too. Um, ignore that, I'll come back to it in a minute. Now, the next thing that they're gonna do is the heat shock. And again, I wanna point out this one, this is a little bit different from PCLO. Uh, the temperature is higher, the time is the same, but um, we're gonna do 60 degrees Celsius for 50 seconds, okay? Um, so 60 degrees Celsius for 50 seconds. This is really important. I had my heat block stuck at PCLO temperature, which is 42, and it did not work. So don't do that. Um, 60 degrees, 40 seconds or 50 seconds. I've done it in, um, I almost always use a heat block instead of a water bath because again, I work in my, I'm like in my dining room. So um, a heat block is just easier for me to use. If you're using a heat block, you want to add water into the wells and let that heat up. Um, so that'll give you a more efficient heat transfer between the, um, the heat block and the tubes. You don't have that air insulating your tubes from the actual heat. Hopefully that makes sense. So just take a disposable pipette and pipette some water in there. There's no, you don't have to measure it or anything. Okay. So, and again, just like with PGLO or any other transformation, it's real important that they do this quickly. They don't want to take their tubes out of ice and meander all over the classroom and then pop them into the water bath and meander back. Um, it should go straight from ice. They carry their tubes and their ice over to the water bath or heat block, put them in 60 degrees for exactly 50 seconds, and then put them straight back into the ice for two minutes. Okay. So um, this procedure actually works really great with PGLO as well. So if you're wanting to increase your transformation efficiency with that, go for it. Okay. Now, oh my gosh, why is it so slow? Sorry guys. So after it sits on ice for two minutes, they're gonna add 250 microliters of LB broth to each tube um, and then close the tubes up, uh, you know, Again, they would want to use different pipettes and tips, of course, um, or disposable would be fine. That's up to you. Um, close the tubes up and let them sit at room temperature. Um, if you are in a community college or college lab and you have like two and a half or three hours, you're going to want to go ahead and plate the bacteria probably. If you're in a high school classroom and you only have 50 minutes, this is a good stopping point. Just let them sit at room temperature overnight. Um, I thought that I would be um, there will be like a million back, you know, a, like way too many bacteria if I let go overnight, it actually worked out really well. Um, so overnight is fine. If you're in a lab where you have plenty of time, just go ahead and plate them after 20 minutes. Okay. And let me go to the next one. So the students are going to have those four plates, the plates are all the same. This is where it's different from PGLO. They have IPTG, um, XGAL, they all have canamycin, even though we don't really talk about that. Um, and they these all have spectinomycin as well. Spectinomycin is what allows us to select just for the transformed bacteria, okay? So they'll all be labeled, you'll have labeled them, or you know, I just had a stripe down the side of mine. I'm, I'm pretty lazy that way. So just tell your students what that means. They can label it themselves. Um, they'll label their plates along the bottom edge, A, B, C, and D. And then they'll plate 100 microliters from each tube onto the corresponding plate. Uh, they're not gonna streak for individual colonies. They'll just streak and cover the whole thing, you know, all different directions, okay? Next, they're going to 
um, tape these up just like they normally would tape them up. The only real difference here is you want to keep things dark again. So like I said, I just tend to put mine upside down in the incubator and cover the window to the incubator. That seems to work well. You can put a box over it if you have a big box. If you order things from BioRad, you have tons of big boxes, unfortunately. Um, uh, Duckling, are they okay in aluminum foil in the incubator? I've never done that. Is it okay to do it that way? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, <laughs> since the, our incubators are dark and they don't have, oh, I see. I've got one that is, um, doesn't have an open window. So I never foil wrap it when I do it in R&D. Um, what we would do usually if it's light sensitive is we, we put foil on top of the window, the window glass. So yeah, that that's really easier. Themselves. Yeah, don't, you don't have to wrap those guys. It's just so much easier that way. So you could put foil over the window. That's a good idea. Over okay. the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Now, um, for timing for this, I usually can see blue within two days. It's normally after 24 hours, I can see colonies, but they're sometimes, sometimes it's, they're kind of small and they're hard to tell if they're blue or not. Um, sometimes I can see it right away. It's very obvious after 24 hours that I've got, you know, blue colonies on A and C, no colonies on B and white colonies on D. Um, if you don't have an incubator, uh, this will take a lot longer. It usually takes five days. It's, it's a while. Um, and if you have colonies, but you can't really see the color very well, try putting them in the fridge for a few days and see if that blue color doesn't develop over time. Okay. Normally it will. I've never had to do that personally, but that's just one of the tricks that R&D has come up with. Okay. So any questions about any of that? Okay. Um, now, on some of your plates, you are probably going to get too many to count, so we just have them divide everything into a quadrant and count one quadrant, multiply by four. Okay, it's pretty standard stuff if they need to, um, just depends on how good their efficiency is. And again, these are their expected results. So they'll see um, blue colonies for A and C. They'll see no colonies for B. That's when we get the cut, but no repair. And their experimental plate D will look like this middle one, white colonies. Okay, and again, the reason we don't have the answers in this PowerPoint is because we assume that this PowerPoint will get into the hands of every student out there. So um, that's why. <laughs> okay, so hopefully it makes sense, though, to you guys. Now, let's talk about, um, so here's the overview of the CRISPR lab. Starter plates plus plasmid, you do the heat shock, you plate the bacteria, look at it in a few days, see if their expected results match their predictions. Um, there's C and D. Sorry about that. Now let's talk a little bit, shift, shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about the genotyping extension. So I mentioned this last week when we talked about the CRISPR explained, but I'll mention it again. Um, one of the reasons that you, you know, it, I think all of us understand why it's important to check genotypes as well as phenotypes. But when you're talking to your students, this is a good story to use with them is uh, this is a gene edited cow and I am I, I grew, I've lived in Mississippi and Texas and, you know, rode horses, but I, I'm embarrassed to admit that for the longest time, I didn't know, um, I didn't know that cows, female cows had horns. Like, I don't know why I didn't know that. But anyway, Damon laughed at me, but um, uh, since he used to work on a dairy farm, but Lots of female cows in the dairy industry have horns and horns, as you might expect, are pokey. And so dairy farmers typically wanna get rid of horns. So they usually cut them off, right? Which is not a fun process for the dairy farmer or the cow. Um, so there was a big push to make gene or, or to, to make, you know, genetically um, or gene edited hornless cows because not all cows have horns. So researchers at Recombinetics spent a lot of time, a lot of money coming up with this gene edited cow um, that had no horns. Great, cows good to go, ready to go. FDA takes a look at it and realizes that they left, uh, they actually do the sequencing, they left a little bit of their cloning bacteria in this cow. Um, that means that the cow is not all cow anymore. It's cow with some bacterial DNA in there. Um, in FDA land, that means it's a genetically modified organism, right? And that is not the goal of uh, the, the biotech company. They did not want that. So there was a lot of research, a lot of time and a lot of money invested and it all went down the drain because they just didn't do the genotyping. They didn't check their work. Um, that's really important. Um, so we're gonna talk about how we do that in this lab next. Okay, so checking your work. Um, oops. So, whoop, okay, let me go back here. My gosh, it's so slow, sorry. So 
we start off in this in this manual and these manuals uh, Yolanda will put the URL in there they're available for you to download now you don't need to buy the kit you're welcome to just look through them. Um, all the information that we talk about not all of it most of it's in the manual and there's even more that we don't have time to talk about um, but this one in particular the geotyping extension is really nice for having your students kind of think through um, what could cause this result so you know if they if they go through the CRISPR lab uh, and that's crucial you have to do the CRISPR lab before you do the genotyping extension this is a separate kit and an add-on but if they don't have their CRISPR results there's nothing to work with, right? So they need those plates in order to do the genotyping extension, the PCR lab. Um, but what your students are gonna do is take a look at their plates. They've gone from blue colonies on their starter plates and now plate D has white colonies. And you can ask them, how did that happen? What, did, what is their hypothesis for what occurred? Um, and hopefully a lot of them are going to say, well, we use CRISPR to edit the gene, right? I mean, that's, that's what happened. Um, but you can push them a little bit farther and ask them, is there another explanation for this? Is there some other thing that could have happened to give you white colonies where before they have blue colonies? So I'm gonna ask you guys that. What other explanation can you think of that's not gene editing that would have given you white colonies instead of blue colonies? So put it in the chat if you don't mind, or you can unmute yourself. What could have, what other thing could have happened? And it could be, put yourself in your student's shoes, okay? I don't want you to be constrained with, you know, what you reasonably know um, could or couldn't happen. What might your students think? What kind of ideas would they come up with? They're usually pretty darn creative. So what kinds of things could you think about? Oh yeah, so mutation, right? And, and selection of that mutation, exactly. Some kind of recombination event. Oh, I'm reading the Cal thing. It's not just genetically, Cal alien antibiotic resistance genes. Ah, okay, so it's not just the bacterial ve vector, it's bacterial antibiotic resistance genes that were left in there as well, which is definitely not good, right? Okay, yep. thank you for that. For getting XCAL, that's like a user prep error, right? Which I, I don't know about you guys, but I have messed up um, all of our labs more ways than I can count. So I have definitely forgotten to like, say, put arabinose into PGLO plates. And guess what? We didn't get any glowing green colonies. Um, so that's something that could happen. Okay. Could be temperature dependent. Okay, so you guys get the idea, right? There's all kinds of ideas that they can have. And if they're struggling, this is a good time, you know, for them to be working in groups. Um, if they're struggling, they can just talk to other groups and see what other ideas they've come up with. And then from that, they can just pick one of those, or you can have them pick as many as they want, but at least pick one and have them think through this process. Um, if this was a CRISPR gene editing event, how could I show that? What, what kind of evidence would I need to show that that happened? And if this was due to um, me forgetting XCAL, for example, um, how could I show that? Or if it was due to a different mutation, how could, I, how could I show that? What kind of evidence can I use to support my claim that it was gene editing instead of one of these other options? Okay, so what would they need? So let me go over here. Okay. Um, here's the whole big picture of the genotyping extension kit. They're starting with their uh, D and C plates. Um, remember, those are the blue colonies on C and the white colonies on D. They're going to just do a colony uh, DNA extraction and they will um, put that extract into uh, master mix and the primers. Uh, there's, there's three different primer sets I'll show you in a minute. Um, they'll do PCR and run the gels. Okay, very straightforward. So let's take a look at that. So the PCR primer, uh, the first set, so this is a multiplex PCR reaction. The first set, oh, sorry, hold on. I'm trying to move you guys around where I can see my screen. Okay, the first set is going to amplify unmodified LAC-Z. Okay, so unmodified LAC-Z we would expect to see in um, the plates that we didn't cut the gene, right? So in C, for example, um, it is going to, we're going to have one primer binding to where that gene editing site is. So if that gene editing site is gone, it won't bind there, right? Um, and so you'll get around an 1100 base pair amplicon from that if the, if Lexi is unmodified, 1100 base pair if Lexi is unmodified, okay? 
The next primer set is going to amplify edited lag C. So uh, one of the primers will bind to the insert, right? So if that insert's not there, we won't get any amplification. Um, if the insert is there, we'll get a 650 base pair amplicon, okay? So 1100 base pair if it's not edited, 650 base pair if it's edited, and we also want to control. So the third primer set is going to um, bind outside of that LAC-C gene and we'll get a 350 base pair amplicon. Um, again, just, you know, this is always good technique for students to understand that we want to make sure that um, we're definitely, you know, our PCR reaction was successful, that we successfully extracted DNA, and uh, this is what's going to tell us if we did that, right? So if we get a band here, we don't get other two bands or something looks weird, then, you know, we, it helps us troubleshoot. Okay, so now your students can take their, their plates and make some predictions. So I have the plates on the left. I just added those here. They're not in the manual like that. You're welcome to use this PowerPoint. Um, but again, remember your X era starter plates are the blue colonies. They actually don't look like this. They look like starter colonies. I didn't have a good picture of one street, right? So a little bit different than, than the one on the top here. Um, plate C is your blue colonies. Plate D is your white colonies. They can think about whether a lactine is edited or not edited in all of those. And then they can make some predictions. Do they expect to see that um, 1080, 1100 base pair amplicon, which again, would be unedited? Do they expect to see that 650 base pair amplicon from the edited LAXI? And would they expect to see that control DNA, that's 350 base pair amplicon? Okay, so they can, they're can they gonna go through and make some predictions on each of those, just yes or no, okay? Um, this is the protocol. I'm just gonna go through it real fast. I, I suspect a lot of you guys have done something very similar to this. Um, they're going to do the starter plate, their C plate, and they'll pick three different colonies from D. Every once in a while, R&D has told me, I'm jealous of them. Um, R&D has told me that they sometimes will see white colonies on D, I'm sorry, blue colonies on D. And so we give them three different, uh, they can do three different colonies from their D plate. Um, of course, if there's a weird one on their D plate, you know, have them do that one, right? In addition to their white ones, so they can see what's going on. Um, uh, I have never had any kind of, I haven't had any luck with any of that. So I always get just, you know, straightforward expected results. <laughs> um, but definitely if there's a weird colony or if there's a colony on B, right? Have them go ahead and, and do that. There's some wiggle room here. Don't follow the protocol if you have some questions um, exact, you know, from their results, something looks a little weird, go ahead and pick those to genotype, okay? So starters, controls, D, or anything, any kind of weird colony, unexpected result on any other, um, on any other plates, that's what you want to genotype. Uh, you're going to flick the ma matrix, um, which is just instant gene. They'll take a single colony with a tip, put it into the um, instant gene, okay? Using a new tip each time. And then they'll heat it up at 56 degrees for 15 minutes in a water bath or dry bath. And then they'll flick it again and then incubate for eight minutes at 95 degrees Celsius, okay? And at this point, this is a good stopping point if you have shorter class periods. But if you're in a longer lab, go ahead and do the PCR, get them in the machine. So um, they'll spin everything down. You want to make sure that instagene is not carried over to your PCR reaction. Remember, because that will chelate the magnesium and um, your PCR reaction won't work. Uh, that's a coenzyme. And so that's important for the PCR reaction. So um, make sure they're only taking the supernatant, you know, make sure they're not going all the way to the bottom and grabbing the instagene here. Um, ideally, this isn't probably the first PCR lab that they're doing, okay? They've done some other things before, so they kind of have a, a, have a, a, a big lab or two under their belt. Now, they're going to add, they're going to do seven tubes, so they'll have their starter, their control, their three, you know, D ones, or if there's some weird ones, they can do those as well, as well as a positive and a negative control um, that's already the, the um, DNA that comes in the kit. They'll add their master mix plus primer. So remember those primers have three, it's a, a multiplex primer, so three of those. And they'll mix that all together. So this is just pretty straightforward. Um, they'll run the PCR samples in the thermal cycler. It's about, um, I don't remember how long it is, a little under three hours if I remember correctly. It's kind of typical. And then just leave them in the thermal cycler overnight at 12 degrees, okay? The next day they'll come back, they'll 
spin everything down, add loading dye. Um, this can be, we usually recommend adding like U view to this. Uh, we, you can also use fast blast though. Um, fast blast is a, I'm sure you've used that before, but fast blast is just a visual stain that you don't need any kind of special equipment for. U view is a loading dye and stain um, that you can view immediately after you run the gel using a UV trans eliminator, right? Or even a handheld UV light works. So if you have one of those, not the little pin light, but the one that's like a bar, um, that one works okay as well. The ground range is 1% gels. And um, there you go. There's, you know, how to load it, run it, go. Um, so here's the gel. This is another thing that students can do while they're running their gels or setting it up is make some predictions about what they think the gel is going to look like. So again, they would look back at their predictions that they made earlier of what amplicons they would expect to see for each of these samples. So in, um, you know, I'm just going to go through these right here, molecular weight ruler, we have that in lane one, their positive PCR control, um, that is going to have all three bands, oops, sorry, um, the PCR sample S, that's from the starter plate, and so that has an intact lag Z gene, right, and so if you remember the intact lag Z gene, we'll have that around 1100 base pair amplicon. Okay, and it should also have the control DNA, yes, because it's, you know, um, as long as your PCR reaction worked. So we would expect to see those two bands. Uh, C should look the same, right? So intact lac Z plus the control DNA. D1, 2, and 3 should be, in theory, I think, I think in this lab we have a, a kind of a weird one for D3, but in theory, if D3 was, was white, right, we would expect to see the edited lag C gene, which was um, around 650. I think that's right. I can't remember off the top of my head. So the smaller one, as well as the control DNA. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. I'm just going to go through and show you what this looks like in real life. So here's a gel and you can see here, uh, we have our marker, we have our positive PCR control. Remember, we're looking at all three um, uh, sizes there. Lane three is our starter plate. So we see that 1100 base pair band as well as that 300-ish um, band from the control DNA. So that's again, the, the top one, the, the larger one is the um, uncut, un, uh, uncut lag Z gene, and the bottom ones are control DNA. The same thing for lane four, which was from plate C. So remember, plate C doesn't have the guide RNA so that no cuts made. Um, five and six are from D. Remember, those are white colonies. So we don't expect to see um, intact lag Z. And in fact, we see that it's cut. Remember that primer set, uh, that darker band that's around six, no, I've forgotten the the base pairs, 6, 50, 30, I can't remember, sorry about that, that middle one, um, that binds in the insert. So unless that insert is there, it won't bind. This is what gives them proof that they successfully added that donor DNA into that cut lac Z gene, okay? Um, so that gives them proof that their DNA was edited and repaired. Okay, which is really great. Okay, Delquan, remind me what seven is. I can't remember. Seven. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm looking. Oh, you know. I think that's just a weird one, right? I think this, I don't, don't hold me to this, but I didn't generate this gel, but I think that, so five, six, and seven are supposed to be the white colonies, correct? Yep. This might have been one of the ones that R&D found that was white, but did not have the middle band, the mutant band. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is one of those really cool ones where you're like, whoa, it's white, but whoa, look at this. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it just opens up such a, an incredible world of, of questions. You know, you're, can just kind of go from there. Yeah, so they can think about what could have happened here in this case. Um, and then the negative PCR control doesn't have DNA, it's just water. So um, you won't expect to see any bands. You can see faint primer dimers down at the very bottom. That's it, okay? Any questions on the gel or the results here? I'm just gonna wait a little bit. Lee, I have a quick question about the, uh, about, um, the extraction, is all of that necessary um, as opposed to just a colony PCR? We do that with colonies that have plasmids in them where you can just pick it and drop it in. 
because it's genomic, you have to do all of the um, extraction. Is that right? I'm going to let Dalquan answer that. I'm sure they tried it that way. Hmm. I'm trying to remember. Um, we had a big team working on this, and I'm trying to remember what she tried. Colony PCR is something that is is a commonly used technique and can be done. Um, but I think what we wanted to do um, to find a robust way to make sure that when you you have clean DNA as your template for this reaction, um, we got much better success with the with this the way um, to extract the DNA this way. Um, okay, great. Thank yeah. you. And so it, it's, um, it was also fat. Mm, I'm trying to think if it was faster as well, but it really just helped guarantee that as you move forward in your workflow, you would achieve success. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to go forward a bit and then I'll leave. Um, we're almost done. And oh, goodness. So um, this is one of the things I wanted to show you guys. We touched on it last week, but we have some capstone project in the um, in the manual. I, now I can't remember if this is in the gene. I think this is actually in the, the CRISPR out of the blue, um, the transformation lab manual. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong. Um, where students can actually look at the bioinformatics of Cas9 um, single guide RNA target sites. So they can look and see, you know, they can pick some different sort of diseases, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell, um, look at the bioinformatics and design a single guide RNA that doesn't have any offsite targets and that might fix the issue at hand, right? And so that gives them an opportunity to really play with bioinformatics in a way that is um, applicable to what the kinds of things that researchers are doing right now, which is really kind of cool. Uh, so this is explained very well. This is something that you can do even without doing the lab. It's available. I think Yolanda can put it up here for you to just download this separately as a separate activity. So that's something that you're welcome to do even, you know, if you're working with students at home um, or trying to figure out things that they can do that's not hands-on because we're, you know, having a pandemic, um, then that might be a good one. Okay. I'm going to add uh, links to all the resources at the very end. Great. Thank you. Thank you. In the chat somewhere, but I'll do it again at the end. Perfect. Um, teacher prep for this one is basically aliquoting super fast and then making gels. If you're in a biotech class, your students are doing that part anyway. And I wanted to go over this too, because this is a new thing that we're doing for all of our kits now. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but we are including kind of like a quick start guide in our New York kits. Um, and we're, I, I think slowly we'll work on putting these in all the kits, but for, we're doing them now just for the new ones and kind of, you know, as we revise manuals and things, we'll probably include these more. But you know, when you get a printer, you don't have a huge manual, like an 80 page manual to stare at. They just give you a colorful one page deal. That's kind of what this is designed for. It has um, the information about where you store the baggie. It gives you a place to write, write the badge number down. That's really important if you ever need to call tech support. Um, they need to know that batch number so that we can see if this is a problem that we need to address, right? Because every once in a while, it's not often, but every once in a while there's an issue. And if we get a bunch of reports and everyone is, you know, it's coming from one lot, um, we want to pull those and, and take a look at it and see what's going on. Uh, it gives you an overview of the activity. And then it, when you open it up, it gives you really the big picture of what you're doing. And so this is kind of a visual flow chart of the lab itself. Um, Suggested timelines are on here. Um, this is the one for the out of the blue kit. And so you can see that the genotyping extension activity is kind of an optional one on the, the right there. And the capstone project is the one that I just told you about. Okay. There's also a modeling activity. I didn't talk about it this week, but we went over it last week. And it's in that PowerPoint that I sent as well. The digital pieces are. You can download that as well. Yolanda will put that link in there. And that is a CRISPR Cas9 modeling activity where they're actually looking at the single guide RNA and um, uh, taking the target DNA and moving it across to see where it binds. The PAM sequence there, it shows them where to cut the DNA and all that. It's really great. Um, so they're designing that in, in that, uh, or they're modeling that in that activity. Um, that's just a, oh, let me point this out too. Well, I'll go here. Uh, the instructor guides are not available in the box. They do not come in the box. The reason is that it is 
imperative, especially for this kit, that we're able to really update these as we need to. Um, and once we print a manual, it's really, really hard to update it. So these will all be digital. Uh, they're there to download. Um, if you do buy these kits, please don't use the one that you downloaded two years ago. Please go and download the newest version because things change, right? Um, we might need to enter, uh, update information about background information. Um, sometimes we update, you know, we made the prep a little bit more streamlined and, and up to date already. So just go, we, when you're ready to do the lab, just go and download the manuals at that point so that you get the latest and greatest information, right? And they're all free. There's no, um, there's no answers in here either. Um, we took the answers out of the manual for this reason because they are freely available on our website. So the instructor guide has and the student guide have the questions for your students, the assessment questions. The answers are printed and in the manual itself or in the box itself, in the kit box, okay? So when you do get the kit box, you'll get that quick guide and you'll also get the, a, a page or two of the answers um, hold on to those answers, right? We don't want to put them online because as soon as we put them online, students get them, right? I, I know y'all know this too. Um, and please, if you do have them, don't scan them and put them online because even though you think you're putting them in your own personal Dropbox, I can guarantee you that they make their way everywhere <laughs> in just a month or so. Um, so we'd like to keep those off out of students' hands as long as possible. I know it eventually will get there, but um, we're trying to make it a little bit more difficult for them. Uh, to find those. So um, the answers are in the box. The manuals themselves you're going to download from the website and you can download those now. Ah, there's the answer guide. Okay. Uh, difference between Fast Blast and NeoView. I think a lot of you guys are already familiar with this. Fast Blast, of course, doesn't require any fancy equipment. Takes a, a you know, I normally do the overnight stain just so I don't have to de stain. Um, and UView is something that you can add, uh, it's similar to cyber. So something that you can add and uh, it is a loading die and stain at 6X and that will enable you to see your results immediately, which is really great. It's a little bit more sensitive, or quite a bit more sensitive as well, okay? Here's the kits themselves. So we have the out of the blue CRISPR kit. That is the transformation lab and everything all together is around 235. Um, the refill alone does not come, it, it comes with the consumables, but not the plastics. I don't believe it comes with the LB auger. We typically don't include that because a lot of people just have jugs of LB auger. Okay, um, so that's something to keep in mind. The out of the blue genotyping extension kit is 199. And that has all the goodies that you need for PCR, including the plastics. The refills 169. We have a ton of resources. So on, uh, you can go here by rad.com slash out of the blue. Um, we have an infographic. We have the capstone projects I've told you about, the modeling. Um, that'll be in the chat as well. Uh, you can find them all at this link. Uh, we also have a, a whole a classroom resources link that's biorad.com slash classroom resources and that includes all of our resources that you might want to use with your students so powerpoints um hands-on activities um videos all kinds of goodies right in addition to that we have a playlist that we curated on youtube we have two different ones one is our CRISPR, our out of the blue playlist that's just, you know, us telling you about our lab. The other one is just a, a, a lot of videos from YouTube that we've curated uh, that we often use when we're presenting, right? So a lot of really great videos on there explaining CRISPR. Um, there's all kinds of wonderful uh, Netflix shows, all that. So a lot of that information is on YouTube and you're welcome to, to go and check that out as well. And if you have ones to recommend, we'd love to hear that too. We have adaptive resources for hybrid teaching. Uh, so if you're in a situation where you're trying to teach students at home or you're trying to teach um, smaller groups, we have adapted a lot of our labs for that. And that is at the top of the biorad.com slash classroom resources. You'll see this um, adapted lab resources PDF that you can download. And if you need help with any of this, talk to Damon and I, just send us an email and we can help you even further. This is um, it's not a one size fits all, right? Because everyone has different class sizes and different expectations of what they can and can't do. Um, but this will at least give you a starting idea of how you can stretch your lab to serve more single students um, or how you might adapt them to serve single students. It includes the prep and the protocols for your students. Okay. Oop, that's not right. 
Okay, so thank you guys so much. I'm gonna stick around. Heather's gonna put a link in here for the survey for um, Innovate in the chat. And in that survey, there's also going to be a um, option for you to let, let us know at Biorad if you want to do a hands-on version of this. So that would be where we send you all the materials and you're playing along with me at home. We go through the whole protocol and you have the results and everything there, okay? So we do trainings like that. Um, so let us know if you wanna take part in that. I'm going to stick around here and um, just unmute yourself if you have questions. And if you want to go and it's margarita time, go for it. So thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you all so much. Um, I just put the um, survey link in the chat for the interview bio survey. Please take that. Um, it really helps us as we as we plan and, and schedule webinars um, in the future. There's a spot for you to add any topics that you want to see. Um, and then, you know, if, if once we kind of hit a, a critical mass of interest, we'll, we'll source the presenter. So we really appreciate you all being here. And remember that next week we have our final installment of the CRISPR series um, at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, same link and you'll get a reminder. Have a great day. Thanks, Heather. Like I said, if you have questions, I'm going to stick around for another 10 minutes or so. So feel free to unmute or type in the chat, whatever you need to do. Nice job, Lee. Thank you. Thanks. Really for, good. Thanks for popping in. <laughs>